Well, it's a real honor to, uh, to provide the, uh, the introduction to the closing keynote to what I consider the most fabulous Mitchell Institute Space Power Security Forum. We really owe the entire Mitchell Institute team a big hand. They have done a fabulous job, please. Thank you. If you probably noticed, the agenda has taken us from the head of the force providing organized training and equipping uh, U.S. Space Force, and now we are going to conclude at the warfighting level with Unified Command. I'm Doug Rayberg. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Air and Space Forces Association, and today we've heard how competitive endurance is critical to deterring, and if necessary, winning the fight. However, we can't lose sight of the fact that we are employing space capabilities today to support ongoing global operations. To talk to us through the changes occurring in the space domain right now, we are glad to have be joined by Major General Brian Gibson. General Gibson serves as the Director of Plans and Policy in the military parlance that he is the J-5 for the United States Space Command, the Unified Combatant Command responsible for conducting operations in, from, and to space. Now, U.S. Space Command works with allies and partners to plan, execute, and integrate military space power into multi-domain operations around the world. You know, the bottom line is, this is where the rubber meets the road to ensure there is never a day without space power. So please give a warm welcome to General Gibson. General Gibson, fights on. Okay, thanks, Doug, and thanks for fights on um, analogy. I'll um, trust to deliver on those words. You know, I have the unenviable position with all of you to know certain things. I'm the last thing on the agenda. I also know I'm the last thing stand between you and whatever's burning. Um, but that also is an opportunity, so I'm going to take it. If you allow me some latitude to start this off, I know there's some other things I know that you know. First of all, I'm not wearing a blue uniform. And I'm one of the few folks in this room where that's the case. And you know what? That's okay. Um, and in my job today, it's a joint requirement for a unified combatant command where we have all the services represented. Um, so it's a real privilege to be here. I also recognize that on my uniform, I have missile defense and space things that I sort of wear from allies, partners in the United States. Nothing about me, just about my background with phenomenal things around the world doing this in joint and combined um, operations. As a matter of fact, I was um, harassing General Deptula a little bit over the past 24 hours. Um, we, we share a past um, in faraway places around the globe doing things on behalf of a nation between two different services and figured out how to make it happen. And um, I think that spirit is emblematic, uh, perhaps even more so today, um, for this domain and the space domain. I also know that I know that you know I'm not General Whiting. I'm not Lieutenant General James, which is on your, um, on your um, tables and those kind of things. And they regret, obviously, not being here. General James specifically had a last-minute emergency and asked that if I could come here on his behalf. So thanks to the Mitchell Institute and for the team for, for, for me stepping in as your um, third string header. I also want to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the Space Force. I'm not in it, so I think I get that liberty. So take it for what it's worth, and this is all good. You know, in the Army, when we acknowledge receipts of orders or we, under, we convey understanding, we say two things, Roger or Hua. What do the Marines say? Hoorah. What's the Navy say? Well, it depends. If you're on a flyer or if you're on the surface or you're below the surface, you say three different things. Um, what's the Air Force say? Copy um, and use a, a lot of joint lexicon. And um, I know the space service is new, just like Spacecom, and we're still building a culture um, built around war fighting and readiness that matters to this nation. So I know this debate about what word or sets of words should we use to help us build our culture and acknowledging, understanding, and receipt of mission. Well, there's one lieutenant general by the name of Rock Miller, I know, uh, from Peterson. If he had his way, it would be Booyah. Um, and I was talking about this with General Sausman last night, and he summarily said no. Um, but in the entrance of space, maybe it should just be Spooyah. I'm not sure. 
But I offer that, that um, all tongue in cheek and, and considerations aside, it's a real honor to be here representing the warfighter um, that shares the same domain with the service. And nowhere else in our military is that the case. And um, we shouldn't use that to our disadvantage. We should use it to our advantage. And if General Whiting were here, I know the first thing I have his mouth would be after a thank you. This is about outcomes over equity. This is not about who does what to whom, although that's the fact of life we find ourselves in the bureaucracy that we live. But this is about getting that outcomes that matter to the nation. They matter to our service, of course, and they matter to a combatant command. But you heard General Saltzman talk earlier today about the essentiality of the domain and trying to make sure that's understood at all levels um, of our government and others. So I, um, I really take that to heart, not only obviously he's my boss, but I deal with it every day. And, and you know, one manifestation of that is you can look at people people's calendars and where they spend their time to get a judgment of priorities at times. Allies and partners are in my portfolio. And in the last six weeks, as today, you've heard a lot about what do we do different with allies and partners? How do we do this in a combined and joint fashion? I know that I've been from South America to Europe, to the West Coast, to the South Coast, and now to the East Coast of this country and our nation talking about that very topic with allies and partners. And it's real. Many of them are in this room today. Many of them are not. And our challenge is to find out how to get a greater effect with the whole. And that whole just doesn't go through US lines, just like it doesn't in any other domain. And I think that's important for us to, to, to think about and as we think about a deeper look at competitive endurance. You know, we are one of the primary end users of what the service, the Space Force, uh, provides. But it's not the Space Force alone. It's all the services. All of the services are investing in capability because they see how essential this domain is to our way of war, which hopefully we never have to execute. But if we do, we certainly should be ready and be willing. And I think today you've heard um, in various discussions that tension and that risk as it plays itself out on are we ready and are we willing? Something we think about every day at United States Spacecom and our responsibilities. You know, he would, um, he would say that the relationship between the command and the service um, is a direct and a special one, and it has to be. You know, I can't think of another instance that is um, the same as this. And we have to address our shared challenges in a shared fashion, in a communicative, a collaborative, and a cooperative manner. What's that mean inside of Spacecom, and what's that mean to the enterprise? You know, after four years of the service standing up and the command standing up, taking on new personalities to lead both of those different organizations, our last commander saying we've reached full operational capability last December, um, that declaration really served as an affirmation that we're prepared to execute our UCP responsibilities. And our unified command plan responsibilities for this command have many of the same responsibilities of every other geographic and functional come gotten command. You pick whatever one you want. We certainly have some of both. And I think that's another part that highlights the special and the unique aspect of the United States Space Command and what that means with our relationship with the service. We campaign across the globe. We're responsible for it. We support exercises. We have to be prepared to provide options to decision makers and to help de-escalate if conflict arrives. We have to make sure we've got the right human capital in order to execute the missions that we've been given. The infrastructure, so we can execute command and control of forces globally and not just on orbit terrestrially. Yes, our domain is 100, kilometer, 100 kilometers and up, out, further away. Pick whatever words you want. But our responsibilities, because of the effects that can be created from that domain, reach all the way to the, all the other domains that you can throw inside of that bucket. 
and have a special responsibility to make sure synchronization, integration, and activity occurs in the timing, tempo, and risk that matters globally, and just not inside of a singular combatant command's AOR. Easier said than done. But it's not new. We stood up a, a cyber command decade, decade and a half ago with a new domain at the time. We've stood up Special Operations Command longer before that, but as an outshoot of the necessity of the time. So I guess my message is, is um, there are new things under the sun, but sometimes those new things that were the past still apply and the lessons that can be learned. So I offer that to the Space Force tongue in cheek again that um, I think I can get away with this and if I can't, tell me afterwards, that's okay. Um, I'll do this from my Army hat. You know, the Army birthed the Air Force, or the Air Force divorced from the Army. You pick whatever side of that story you want. For the right reasons at the right time, in order to get a better outcome for the nation. In turn, the Air Force birthed the Space Force at the right time, at the right place, for a set of unique conditions. So I guess it goes to say, the Army... Space Force, you're our grandkids. We're counting on you, and so is the nation. <laughs> uh, I also highlight um, that, you know, for his Title X obligations on behalf of General Whiting, just like our uni Unified Command Plan responsibilities, our number one priority is to produce plans for the employment of forces. So I guess I get judged, and we get judged on how well we do that, and that's not a singular activity. It's with all of you in this room whether it's military, civilian, government, or between countries. To take actions if we have to, to deter, to deter conflict, and to command the armed forces. But the, the unique set of responsibilities that don't apply to all the other geographic combatant commanders are things that most of you in this room know about. Conducting space operations, executing global sensor management, making sure we appropriately execute global SATCOM operations, support for trans-regional missile defense, and making sure that we have, a, we have a, an invested stake in space joint provider roles and responsibilities. Nowhere else in any other combatant commander service will you see those five things directed in that way. It's not saying we're special, but it is inside of that bucket of things that we're responsible by law, by policy, and by direction that we take very seriously. The, the third thing I think General Whiting would focus on is, in his words, he sees his responsibilities as a moral responsibility to provide capabilities for the joint force, the nation, and our allies. And those are his words, and that's an interesting choice of words. Um, and he would go on to explain um, that in his mind, that is a fundamental and a big change, at least from his perspective. You know, you can appreciate more than most audiences and what you've heard today that um, unless we allow continued safe, sustainable, renewable, accessible access to space, that our way of life is fundamentally altered. And therefore, it takes on the moral responsibility that he underpins it with to make sure it stays that way. Uh, so he grounds that really in his third set of um, hats that he wears and priorities um, to make sure that we understand what potential enemies are not just doing beyond the next hill and not just maintaining command and control of our forces around the world that are untethered from terrestrial networks if necessary. And that we operate precisely with precise munitions or we're delivering humanitarian aid as a function of um, our responsibilities. But all, around, all of that while remaining completely synchronized in time, space, and purpose, short of war fighting. It's moral. It underpins not only our way of life, but everybody else's way of life as well. And for him, it matters. You know, I joined the Army a long time ago. I'm not as old as others in this room. I won't call you out. Sorry. <laughs> General Teptula, maybe you, sir. No, I'm sorry. Uh, not General Chilton, for sure. Um, and like many of us in this room who have got a few decades under our, our belt, we came in with the lack of GPS and we came in with maps, compasses, whatever tools that were available to us. 
in my line of work as a Patriot missileer early in my career, I had aiming circles that had mills on it instead of degrees. And I had gunner's quadrants. No, they weren't sextons to look at space um, from the maritime domain. But I had those tools. And guess what? I could emplace a weapon system and fire a missile with those tools. And then the advent of GPS came along. And I thought it was the greatest thing um, that I'd ever seen until it wasn't available. And a few years later, because the service had taken it for granted and had stopped issuing maps and compasses, had stopped training our initial training on operators how to do manual things, we couldn't perform our mission. And you can take that to any other capability in this room that we've all served in in our services, and that same analogy applies. But that's in the span of one 32-year career up to this point. My, how times have changed. I know this. I never want to have to go back to a GPS-denied environment, but we better embrace it because that may come. And whatever we do as a service, as a military, and as a security enterprise, we should make sure we never forget what it means to the operator on the ground if that occurs. And whatever we're developing, and whatever we're trying to develop, whatever we're fielding on whatever timeline, whatever we're buying from Congress, whatever we're war fighting from a combatant command, it's always about the sailor, the soldier, the airman, the coast guardsman, the guardian, and the allies and partners on the ground. Even if it's for strategic systems that we must make available for strategic decision making. And I think for us, that's what I try and after all these years, to, to not forget what it meant to be a, a new service member in this great adventure we call the United States military. And I think if all of us keep our focus on that, we're probably going to be okay. If we lose our focus on that, or if we get distracted by other things, which are probably very important and have to be racked and stacked inside of all of our bureaucracies, we likely won't get the same outcomes that are necessary. Um, in order to execute what our nation expects us to do. And our nation expects us to fight and win our nation's wars if we have to. We don't want to, we don't prefer to, but we better be ready to. And I think today's um, institute and, I know, and today's forum and many other forums, we talk a lot about the things that enable us to war fight if we have to. The person is the most important thing to never forget in that things that we need to war fight with. And um, I appreciate this audience for allowing us to remember that um, because assured access to space and all of our services as they've been designed, organized, trained to have full and free access to space is a fundamental assumption I don't want proven false. And I hope none of you do either as we go through um, what each of our responsibilities are. General Whiting also recently published a new vision for the combatant command and um, focused once again on a familiar time frame. Anyone want to take a guess what year? 2027. It's surprising, huh? Um, and I think we all know why in this room. But it reads as such as that United States Space Com conducts dynamic, partnered, and integrated space operations and transregional missile defense support to enable the joint force lethality and effectiveness while protecting it from space-enabled attack, extending our advantage over competitors, and successfully operate in the face of threats arrayed us. Pretty succinct, what you would expect, hopefully, from a warfighting organization. But there's some key points in there that um, he would emphasize as well. He would emphasize that um, we have to turn United Spacecom into an operational warfighting command, and that is his focus. And. Um, Within the context of outcomes over equities, working with others, he is solely focused and has his staff, me being one of those, every day focused on that fundamental challenge and tenet. How do we achieve that vision, but how do we do it through a warfighting lens? So how does Space Force theory of success that we heard from today, and I know General Salzman has published over the last year, um, and the concept of competitive endurance fit within that strategic vision and our responsibilities? particularly the moral responsibility side that uh, General Whiting anchors on. You know, we are the primary end user of the forces from the Space Force. It's important to us just as it's important to you. The Guardians, 
likely represent the preponderance of today's forces that we will command and control. So we're vested. It matters to us. Our ability to accomplish our mission directly depends on what the Space Force presents to us. Not entirely, but mostly. So it's real. It is more real to us than perhaps most every other thing. We're pleased with the initiative, the intellectual rigor that we go in and we talk about what competitive advantage means. These are the type of discussions we have to keep having. And I trust that all of you, um, and we'll continue to have it well past today through the various forums that are out there to think about um, what General Saltzman has laid out. We strongly agree with how the Space Force sees the emerging environment. We share a, si a, a simultaneous and also not a different sight picture of the world. And it's a dangerous neighborhood. But there have been dangerous neighborhoods before in our past. And although we might not have had a space domain that we particularly called out or a cyber domain, we rose to the challenge to meet the dangers in our near abroad. And this domain, uh, specifically from PRC in Russia, or from the, the PLA specifically on behalf of the PRC, uh, it undoubtedly can transform this domain and contested and a warfighting domain. And we better embrace it. We need to embrace it today and not tomorrow. And then we need to embrace it every other day thereafter as we think about what we're doing. Um, I just came from the Pacific in my last job, and I was in charge of air defenses for all of the Pacific for the Army, and then was the joint um, working in the joint headquarters as the Deputy Area Air Defense Commander. And um, if any of us in this room think that PRC is developing a military to only secure their borders, I think we're kidding ourselves. I don't want to fight. You don't want to fight. We don't want to go to war. But I think General Whiting's words that he used when he was on the Hill testifying publicly were breathtaking on um, what, not only in space, but every other domain, as you all know, what the PRC has undertaken and continues to pursue. It's going to be an impregnable border if, in fact, they filled, if they filled all those capabilities on the timeline they do. And that will be the least of our concerns. We also agree with the Space Force's thoughts about the difficulty of contesting and controlling the domain, as General Saltzman laid out. Our AOR is the largest. I know that doesn't make Indopaycom happy. That's okay. Um, and it shares a boundary with every other terrestrial geographic AOR. Boundaries are our problems, not the enemies or adversaries. We create them. We accept risk when we put them in place and we must integrate across them and synchronize across them. The domain is clearly unique, but it is not special. I hate to tell that to you. If we treat the domain as special, we will lose. And you've heard some things, this is Brian Gibson's opinion, you heard some things from Dr. Plum earlier about policy and trying to reduce classification barriers, We've heard some things from industry about um, their own investments on how to do things. But the domain has characteristics that are unique, but not special. Similarly, we believe warfighting in space is unique, but it is not special. The fundamental tenets of warfighting apply yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And our focus is squarely on that from um, the United States Space Command. It has many of the same rules that govern terrestrial warfighting. Some, there's a lack of rules, which we know about what's responsible behavior in the domain. We absolutely need to work together so we can normalize space warfighting so that it looks like warfighting, but just in space, if we have to do it. We also agree that future space warfighting includes in-domain operations, and that a military service dedicated to the organizing, training, and equipping functions that is focused on that, on that domain will still play a very central role in preparing for that fight, should it come. However, we also find great value in leveraging the diverse and unique experiences from the best and the brightest of all. 
and not just inside of our own lines. And our named operation, Operation Olympic Defender, is in fact a named operation. Just like Operation Inherent Resolve. This is about, you pick any other named operation that we've had from a Western perspective when we've gone to conflict or crisis in our recent past. Same thing applies in the space domain. A method to do things together and to do it better together. So we are solely focused on how do we operationalize Operation Olympic Defender better. And we invite others to join us. Sure, there's some intelligence things that you heard about earlier today that are the reality that we all live in. Sure, there's some security classification things that we're seeking to get better at. But in every other instance over the past couple decades, we found a way to include people at the pace and desire for which they want to be included. And we should do the same in this domain. And it will be different. It will be unique, but it won't be special. It will be driven by a military coalition of those that share values and interest on behalf of that domain. So I invite others in this room, not only inside the United States lines, but across our allies and partners to help us be better than what we are today. Certainly in the, few, in the future, space warfighting will involve more than individual weapon systems engaging individual targets, or it could, or maneuvers between individual spacecraft. It may, in fact, resemble more large-scale terrestrial conflict if we get to that point, which none of us want to get to as we heard about the idea of deterrence and what that means for the domain. As an operational headquarters, SpaceCom must be able to coordinate, synchronize, and control simultaneous effects in multiple domains on a super global scale. We're both, in General Whiting's words, a supporting command and a supported command. And although unique, not special. Many of our other combatant commands share unique responsibilities where they have simultaneity of authority and timing and tempo and risk decisions that must be made inside of an AOR that has input, integration, synchronization, and requirements to others. And this domain is the same. This domain for SpaceCom is not only a supporting command. And if we treat it that way, we won't have a command to warfight the domain. It has to be both. And it has to be both with our eyes wide open at the enterprise level. We also agree that the three core tenets of competitive endurance, the avoiding operational surprise, denying the potential adversaries the first mover advantage, and uh, being prepared to undertake responsible counter space campaigning, we agree that those tenets align with and they complete our responsibilities, specifically our UCP responsibilities in the AOR. They are, they are nicely aligned. Today, the PRC and Russia are explicit about holding US and allied space capabilities at risk. You've heard it many times, we know it. They know that we rely on space and they want it. And that, just like the equal focus on what it means at the individual level, should equally be in focus for us, our sole focus on what we're trying to defend against should it happen. You know, capabilities from China, like you heard from General Gagnon earlier, uh, dual use technology that's out there, um, and direct um, ascent anti satellite missiles are clearly intended to deny us access to the domain. They are not for purposes of securing their borders, wherever they may be, terrestrial or otherwise. They seek to negate our advantages. We've reached a historic inflection point. All of our energies will remain focused on war fighting inside of this command. And if we don't, Hold us account. Come up on the net. Don't respond with a copy. Or spuya. Or ura. Or hua, for that matter. 
you know, I think fortunately, the United States, along with our like-minded partners, remains the foremost military space power in the world today. We can't sit on our laurels and, and, not, um, and not believe that that will enable us to continue to have the same advantages that we've enjoyed over the past several decades. So while that may be true today, don't let us guide it to be our truth in the future any differently. Our space architecture today is a legacy environment that operates in benign environments. Folks have talked about that today. This wasn't the result of intentional decisions. It was a reasonable outcome based on the times at hand and the decisions that were made as a country. So in order to ensure we are ready, given some of those facts, to dominate in any potential future crisis, we've established four priorities to guide the efforts of the command. First priority, prepare and posture to maximize readiness by 2027. Second priority, counter threats to achieve space superiority when and where needed to operate through all levels of conflict. Third priority, strengthen relationships to build the coalition. And fourth priority, expand our war fighting advantage. And hopefully you can easily see how those are nested inside of what the service is attempting to achieve. It's intentional, it's by design, it's focused. And we're gonna stay laser focused on those four priorities. We recognize that no one alone, no service, can give us the competitive advantage that we need to, to have. So we're gonna be a joint teammate focused on outcomes out of, over equities. The days of standing up a service and a combatant command are in our rearview mirror. We should learn from it. We shouldn't forget it. But we certainly should move forward in a way that gets the outcomes we need at the department and, and the congressional level other than arguing about who has what responsibility inside of the domain. Because all of us, if we do that, we get less effective outcomes. Pick it in the budgeting world, pick it in the policy world, it doesn't matter. So we're focused about being a great joint teammate, and we mean that. Because we understand the moral responsibility that this domain um, provides to the success of a future fight. We also have learned a little bit from other folks today, and you know about, about how we integrate commercial folks and entities across the enterprise. One of those big ones, new ones, will be Department of Commerce in our future. And um, what that means for space situational awareness versus space domain awareness. We have no intent to not be able to understand what is going on in the domain of space. Certainly safety of flight, all those other things that can fit neatly and more nicely under non-military buckets at the national level is important to get after. But it's DOD, the service in SpaceCom has the responsibility to have space domain awareness. Not situational awareness, domain awareness. So although we may be signing space sharing agreements with a whole bunch of countries and companies, and we have all these integrated sets of ways from commercial integration cells to the JCO to whatever it may be, that is all great. But if it goes against the premise of not allowing us to have a better space domain, space domain awareness outcome, we're not gonna pursue it. And I think that's important because you should expect that from us. You should expect that from the Warfighting Combatant Command. So it'll be interesting to see, especially as we talk about further and further orbits out around cislunar, XGO, all these other things, what does that mean? It's gonna be a great discussion. I know it continues every day and we'll continue to be part of the dialogue. Our commercial partnerships are important. They're important in our partnerships with our allies and partners. But from a military perspective, they need to be aligned under space domain awareness. And they need to make sure we understand what's occurring. You heard some, some things about space launches. It's, I, always, I always like to hear how we categorize who's doing what to whom. Are we outpacing? Are we being outpaced? And right, 
there's some good quotes about mathematicians and figures. I won't quote it because I was a math under guy. I'm a math undergrad, and I'll screw it up. Um, but I guess my point is, is that um, quantitative numbers are important, but so is qualitative. And certainly number of launches is one of those vectors we should measure as a country, as a military, as a nation on our access to the domain. It shouldn't be the sole thing we measure. It certainly is important. The responsive space, operationally responsive space, tactically responsive space, call it what we will, the necessity to get things there fast on our timing for our, our effect, absolutely essential. We agree with it wholeheartedly. Hard to do, as we heard about today from our industry and a few others. If you look past, if you look, look past today and towards 2027, we absolutely agree also with the advocacy for new space capabilities and capacity. It's not just about new kit. It never has been and it shouldn't be. It is a combination of that kit in the hands of warfighters um, that is the right magnitude, has the right training, and has the right readiness level to prosecute a fight if required to do so. We agree with 2027, and I agree with General Pepper that in order to do 27 is 25, but I also know there's an inherent danger to tying timelines to delivery of things. All I would say is that look at the world and the trajectory it's on. Sooner is better, whatever that timeline may be. We agree wholeheartedly with it. We believe that there are 10 priority military capabilities from a space warfighting perspective that we advocate and synchronize with the service and others. We believe those priority capabilities are in order. First, have a resilient, timely space operational command and control. Hopefully you would expect to hear that from a warfighting combatant command that conducts C2 of forces. Secondly, integrated space fires and protection. Third, a modernized agile electronic warfare architecture. Fourth, Enhanced battle space awareness for space warfare. Fifth, space system cyber defense. We heard a little bit about that today. Sixth, persistent and resilient intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. This idea of birth to death doesn't only apply in other domains. It, we absolutely should apply better than what it does today in the space domain. Communications and data transport capacity in all bands. Eighth, global sensor management with integrated sensor tasking and data retrieval from our sensors arrayed right around the globe. Ninth, resilient satellite C2 architecture and 10th, operational intelligence. So I'll leave it and I'll end it here and I'll be more than welcome to take a few questions if time allows um, based on your thoughts. But I hope you took away from today is that we're operationally focused. We want to be a great teammate. We're rapidly operationalizing the command, focused on our Title 10, our unified command responsibility, and moral responsibilities. We look forward to continuing the discussion of competitive advantage. It's important. Space always has been, and it must remain a team sport, and just not between the service and one combatant command. And together, we're gonna fulfill the promise to this country and to our allies. Not only to ensure that there will be a day without space, but to ensure there will be a day without space, dot, dot, dot. And you fill in the dots. Thanks for your time. I look forward to your questions. Sir. Oh, I thought there weren't going to be any. We're at the end of time. Please, ma'am, go ahead. Sir, Major Constantine Barreto. I'm with the Staff IA. Uh, sir, CSO had discussed today the rollout of the uh, commercial space uh, strategy from OSD and from the, from the service. Uh, what are potential plans from a, a space comm uh, perspective uh, related to rolling out a collaborative uh, ally and partner strategy similar to the commercial strategy? Yeah, thanks. Really good question. I appreciate that. The topic du jour today, right? Um, United Space, Spacecom, believe it or not, why the service was standing up and OSD hadn't published one, created a commercial space strategy. Maybe good or bad, 
for others to, to debate, but I guess to the point of doing things together, th this idea of at what echelon do we need to provide policy guidance, service Title X trained man and equipped guidance, um, and warfighting guidance to how we get better with commercial, I think it's essential. And we certainly should have them nested in a line. So I think in answer to your question, there is absolutely an opportunity to continue to discuss through the combatant command without stepping on the toes of others, how, where, and when do we integrate commercial partnerships inside of the command? And whether that's inside of our own lines or inside of lines internationally, um, those are unconstrained at this point. Does that answer your question? No? Uh, well, I'm not going to give you the specifics, I'm sorry, but please come talk to me afterwards some more about it, seriously, and uh, I'll dive more into the discussion with you, okay? Thank you. My question is, I personally have POTS, plain old telephone service, <laughs> at the top good. of line at home. With the wiring of the current U.S. household and how, how we are dependent on technology and how satellites could be taken out by PRC or P the PLAs, how worried should an average civilian like me be about the state of our infrastructure and where we're going with things? Thank you, sir. That's a really good question. You tied the bridge to space. Um, but, but seriously, a travesty for sure, um, not only in this region. But more broadly to your, your question, you know, as General Saltzman said earlier today, we don't have the luxury to stop doing things with the things that we have today in order to spend resources to modernize, to get more things, to do things differently. Said another way, the things we have today, we have to make better and we have to be able to war fight with them. And it's not this easy trade-off, which sometimes isn't so easy about stop doing things on this hand with these things so you can create new things to do it with this hand five years from now. I think inside of this service, that's an impossible. My words, he didn't put it that way, but I suspect he'd, he'd frame it sort of that way. I'm looking at his deputy three over there and I'm getting a head nod, I think. I'm on, on target there. But to your point, um, I don't think that's unique to this domain either. Uh, right? We have war fighting capabilities that have been fielded for well over 50 years in other domains. After Vietnam, just in the Army alone, we created the Big Five, an M1 Abrams tank, a Patriot weapon system, an Apache helicopter, the, the um, Pallet and Howitzer and a few other things. And that same thing applies. Pick C-130s in the Air Force or pick whatever you want. So I, I think it's a, it's a very viable an important question to understand um, the necessity to war fight with the things you have today, understand where you must improve them over time to keep making them a viable option as you bring new capabilities in the future. Thanks, ma'am. And I think I got the hook, I'm out of time. Thanks, sir and team for your time. Well, General, I, I, I didn't get to ask a question because the audience was so, so attentive. That was good. But I, I just want to make one comment that resonated with me. Many of everything you said resonated, but in particular, I think there's this sense that um, U.S. space comms only service component is Space Operations Command uh, and the Space Force. When... Um, in 1985, an F-15 shot down a satellite. Now, it was a kinetic kill, created debris. We decided that wasn't such a good idea. But the warhead doesn't have to be kinetic. It could be an EMP. It could be something that takes out a satellite. So the Air Force ought to be working on capabilities that support space superiority, in my view. In 2008, US STRATCOM shot down a satellite in orbit using an SM-3 off a Navy ship. So the Navy component ought to be a component to your command when you're asked to attain space superiority or to take out a threat that is threatening Admiral Aquilina's fleet moving across the Western Pacific. 
The Aegis radar can add to situational awareness in space, space domain awareness. The TIPI-2 radar, operated by a missile defense, the United States Army, can add to space domain awareness. And so all services should be, there should be a demand function on all services to give you the capabilities you need. And, um, and frankly, we're not seeing it yet. And um, this has to be a joint fight, supporting your joint operations so that you can deliver the capabilities necessary for the terrestrial combatant commanders. And I think that's a discussion we need to have at Mitchell. And uh, we'll carry, put that on the short list of things we'll want to talk about next year at this forum and, and between now and then, is how all services can support your combatant command and, and the critical things it has to do. Well, this has been a heck of a party. And I always say, you know, to my guests when they come to the house, it wouldn't be a party if you didn't show up. It'd just be me and my wife. So I want to thank everybody who took time out of their calendars, who traveled from afar from New Jersey, the, the Air Force Association reps there, but people who came in, all of you who came in from around the country, even locally here and fought the traffic inside the Beltway to, to get here today. Thank you so much for coming to this Mitchell Institute sponsored forum. I hope it, it, it met your needs and I hope it uh, is something you're excited about and look forward to next year. I also want to thank the people that make it possible. So the women in black over here behind General Deptula, raise your hands. Anybody from Mitchell here that's in the audience, I know a lot of them are outside. This would not, Charles, please stand up. Charles, stand up. A one-man band here leading this with great support from Camilla and Anna Maria and so many others in Mitchell Institute that air, air and space side, you talk about an integrated team. Lucky Penny in the back's on the air side. She's here pitching in as well. Uh, we work as a team because air and space are inseparable as far as providing combat operations. That's the way we look at it. And uh, I want to thank the team for everything they've done. And with that, I want to bring up my boss, General Deptula. So Dave, over to you. I won't take too much time. Uh, Chile already did some thank yous. Um, I also want to single out the uh, Air and Space Forces Association uh, communications team uh, headed by uh, Tobias and uh, Evan. Thank you very much. And Jen uh, and Camilla and Ana Maria and General Chilton, uh, too. So, yeah, these are the folks who put it together. I also would like to offer my thanks to our industry partners and teams for your support, because guess what? We couldn't do this without your support. So uh, thank you very, very much. Um, our partners uh, from every one of the armed forces, uh, as well as our OSD friends, although sometimes they have different perspectives, but that's one of the reasons why we have all perspectives up here. I'll just conclude by reemphasizing that space is a warfighting domain in order to succeed in accomplishing our nation's security objectives, we have to be able to do both defense and offensive operations in space. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, uh, and I wish you a great space power kind of day. Thank you.